Now time for another Q&A. So my last Q&A, I think, uh, goes back to part 9 or 10 uh, of uh, this build, uh, the Mendo Cello build. And uh, I did get a few questions here and there uh, because of uh, the volume of questions was pretty low. Uh, I decided to kind of compile most of the questions. At this point in time, I feel it's a good point to have like enough content to make another one. So it's going to go from part 9 to part 18. So the questions are going to be within that realm of uh, uh, content. So the main question that kept coming back to me was uh, when or if I was going to make the blueprints available because as you know there is no other blueprints online for making a Florentine style mando cello. So my blueprints are now available. They became available yesterday. Uh, so it's a full size uh, rendered copy of the blueprint. The paper size is 5 by 3 so if you download the PDF uh, option uh, you will need to have a 36 inch printer access to a 36 inch printer and you will or uh, a zero would be in the other format uh, but uh, the PDF is available for that um, I also still have the octave mandolin blueprints that I'm selling those ones are two by three same thing full size with all the needed information and another question that keeps coming every so often and it's from three years ago is when I made this ukulele uh, as a kind of fun project to uh, like when I started my YouTube channel I made a 2x4 project so if you haven't seen that video this uh, ukulele was made from a 2x4 and it's a three-part video and I'll leave a link at the end of this one uh, but I keep getting asked if I have blueprints for this ukulele uh, that could be a very nice sounding instrument if it was made with decent wind, even... So, uh, I'm gonna get started on those and get blueprints made. I'm hoping maybe within a month or two I should have those only in PDF format on my website uh, for sale. And like, I'm, I'm guessing about $10 uh, range for uh, the ukulele drawings because there's not a lot of information on it. So. I should be able to get that done really quickly amongst other things. So back to the mando cello and the questions. Uh, Walter was asking, uh, and that's in regards to the uh, carbon fiber reinforcement rod, why epoxy instead of white glue? So the epoxy has better bonds uh, with regards to the carbon fiber compared to the white glue. Uh, to the carbon fiber. So in this configuration I, I felt more confident scratching the surface or the carbon fiber uh, reinforcement rod and using a long curing uh, epoxy to make sure that the bond was going to be uh, good. So the next question is by uh, one Pi Pliner. Sorry if I messed up the name there. Um, uh, he's curious about the Mento Cello fretboard. Uh, he, see, he says that he seems very close to an acoustic guitar for, for referencing from other, uh, from what he can see on YouTube. So uh, the fretboard scale uh, is really close. If you go to the Mando Cellos that were built by Gibson, it was 24 and 3 quarter. Gibson still to this day have guitars at 24 and 3 quarter. Uh, as for Mando Cello, we're going back then. They had the 24 and 3 quarter, but I also seen uh, people pushing it to 27 inches, which makes quite a stretch to play. Uh, it actually adds a lot more tension onto the C string because the C string, when you're at 24 and 3 quarter, has a bit of a thud sound. And that's why I went with 25 and a half on this build because I wanted to have some ring to the, the C string. So uh, kind of a bit of a compromise into both, but uh, uh, this one is at 25 and a half, which is close to a fender scale, uh, if not right on it. Uh, as for uh, the nut spacing, uh, at the nut I have one and five eighths, which is really close to most acoustic guitars, uh, give or take a few sixteenths there. The next question is from Kramer Guitars. He's asking um, why carving the inside of the plate first? Uh, his guess is uh, it's easier for holding to work. 
Uh, for me, it's uh, an order of preference. Uh, I've seen both done. Uh, a lot of people like to carve the outside and shape it to visual appeal uh, first and then they can remove a lot of wood from the inside to tune their plate to where they want it to have like the top resonance that they are looking for. Uh, I like to do the inside first because when the inside is done I don't have a rocking plate on my workbench because if you picture you, you just did the outside profile it's uh, a bit of a bubble and then you try to have that on your bench or you have to make a cradle to hold it in place and then use that. So over the years I found that carving the inside didn't really change the outside aspect for the way I'm working anyway and uh, actually helps me hold the plate in place. So uh, that's why I, I do my plates carved on the inside first. Now, in regards to carving uh, the plates, uh, James Bell asked, uh, have you ever tried or considered a rotary carver like the Arbor Tech? So yes, I, I did think about it. The Arbor Tech was uh, a bit over my price range when I know I already have all the tools to do it here. Um, now that I, I know this instrument sounds great and most likely will be making more in the future, it is definitely something I might look into, especially for the backboard, because the backboard took me a long time. Uh, my hands were killing me. Uh, it's such a big piece of maple and I was stubborn trying to get it done as fast as possible, where I should have had that plate sitting on the corner of my bench while working on other, do other things at the same time and then carving this plate on a longer amount of time. So um, definitely in the future uh, when building another instrument like that I will most likely look into the Arbor Tech spinning uh, plane uh, that they have. Uh, following on this Walter asks uh, why not use a carver's mallet? Uh, I like the precision that my hands have when I actually do a wood removal also, the constant hit of a mallet, even though they're, they're small blows, might affect either the wood fibers or the glue joint. Uh, that's always something I've been kind of uh, reluctant on using while carving something like that because uh, in some sections it gets pretty thin and uh, just a wrong uh, hit and then you might actually like separate that glue joint or create a stress that you don't really want to have. Uh, when you're working like that. So another question with regards with the soundboard and backboard. Uh, Matt Taylor is asking why am I uh, removing the lines that I made off my pattern so quickly uh, at the beginning because like they're right on top and that's my graduation so why, why did I re remove them so quickly? So those lines are there to align where I'm going to drill my pilot holes. Uh, in the in the plate and those pilot holes all have different height and it's uh, created by creative spacing and locking my drill press uh, with a, a kind of a prop under the the plate so the plate is riding onto that uh, bolt and then uh, by drilling it just creates the proper depth so once those depth have been transferred, those lines on top become kind of irrelevant. We don't really need them anymore. So that's why when the pencil lines uh, have done their job with providing location for drilling those uh, depth holes, uh, they're not needed anymore. So following up with another question with Matt Taylor, uh, what did you do about the squeeze out inside the body when you glued the back? Uh, there's not really much you can do about them. Um, there's no access really to remove anything. So with experience, when like with the amount of glue ups that you do, uh, a good practice is the soundboard. You you will see how much extra glue squeeze out you get from that one, and then you can kind of gauge uh, at the back. You you want you want to see some glue, but you don't want the whole thing to be dripping on the inside. And with with regards with this one, add a bit of squeeze out on the outside because I don't know if you remember from the video I was showing that I had a spring back which created kind of a, a, a squeeze out towards the outside instead of like bulging which would create a squeeze out towards the inside. So that really helped me. I had a bit of squeeze out on the outside but not very much and after inspection inside I had a bit of a squeeze out towards the tail block 
and a bit onto one edge only and that was very very minimal not enough to to make a drip something that uh, uh, I did in the past as well when I see that there's a, a bit too much on the inside instead of leaving the instrument with forcing gravity down which the glue would start dripping on the inside I would flip it back over and that way I would be able to uh, kind of contain onto the perimeter of the curving. Here's a question from John McDonald. Uh, he found that when tapping on guitar tops, uh, it will generate a different note uh, depending on where he holds it on the plate. He's asking if it, happened, if it happens to be the same with uh, the, the mandolin cello or mandolin families, I'm, I'm assuming. So I usually hold the, the plate right on the nib here, so like it's mostly st it's staying up freely. Um, and that way I can generate like a, a, a similar tone. Something I've noticed as well is as soon as you start lifting your plate, like on an angle, I don't know if you can see that, that's kind of transparent. But if you put it, let's say on a 45 degree angle, uh, there's obviously gravity that's gonna bring uh, tension into the mix and that's going to affect like by maybe a quarter uh, note uh, you're, you're reading. So uh, I always try to leave it at gravity and then use it for that. As, as in regards for the soundboard when I do the tone bars it's already glued onto the rim therefore I can use the actual neck block to hold it and that will not affect at all the, the reading. What affects the note is like the vibration of the other tone bars, uh, the other tone bar, I should say, inside the body. So if you can muffle that sound by a clipping on a piece of leather or whatever, that helps a lot. And I actually show how to do that in my octave mandolin uh, tuning. So I have a comment by Blind Man Sixty. He was asking if that binding is plastic. Have you tried to tape it in place and drip it some acetone? So that's in regards to the issue I had. I don't know if we can move that here. The issue I had with the tip of the fretboard right here, uh, where I had issues where the, the, the binding didn't want to stick onto the, the surface where, where it was ingrained on the ebony. So uh, I did mention that and I did work uh, after, uh, afterward on to fixing that issue. Uh, I, I realized I never came back on it and did get that message after it was already fixed. So uh, uh, what I ended up doing was uh, I ended up resanding the inside and I put the Duco cement uh, glue on it and taped it shut for like 24 hours. And when the 24 hour was done, I removed the back side of the tape and put some very thin super glue along that seam and re-taped it in place and left it to dry. So uh, I don't think that thing's going anywhere. Uh, it hasn't shown any sign of stress. So uh, an, a comment here by the turtle carpenter says that I think you're quite attached to the six pound. Uh, yes, the, the lighter the instrument is, the more response you're gonna have from it or the longer the vibration is gonna be moving inside all the components. So it was, it was very important to me to get a nice, very responsive instrument and keeping the weight down for that purpose. So uh, along the video you saw that I, I was waiting a lot of the parts. I don't think I mentioned the actual weight right now with all the stuff on it. So I've got the tuners, the bushings, the strings, the nut, the tailpiece, the bridge is on. All the components are on except for the binding. And I'm at six and a half pounds at the moment. So it's exactly if you go back to the, the first videos that I made like early on, I was expecting, I said, I think 6.5, 6, between 6 and 7.5 and I'm right on the money. So I'm really happy that uh, I got this instrument to be this light and responsive. So the next question is from Nathan Fisher and he's saying one thing that sort of puzzle, puzzle him uh, is uh, why don't I don't, why don't, don't I get somebody that knows how to play my instrument to showcase them instead of having me kind of struggling on them. And uh, he's phrasing it in a very nice way. I'm not offended at all. Uh, he's totally right on point. He's right. I'm not a very good player. I spent all my extra time uh, learning more on how to get those instruments 
to the point they are. Uh, this, like the woodworking or the luthery is my art. It's not playing or uh, being a musician type form of art. Like I came from the woodworking side. Uh, so um, uh, why don't I get somebody? Well, uh, I just moved here uh, two years ago, two and a bit, uh, or going on two years. And uh, I don't really know a lot of people here. Uh, now, that being said, um, I contacted a uh, now friend of mine, which is the uh, customer of the Octave Mandolin, uh, to see if he would be interested to give this guy a try and that way I can uh, get a video footage from it. And then uh, we would kind of work out a barter thing because he's a really talented musician and uh, I really appreciate him taking the time off his schedule to, to play this for me. So that way I'll be sharing his information for you guys to learn more about him. And then I'll leave uh, Barry Wilson's uh, clip of the octave mandolin at the end of this video so you can see for yourself uh, the sound that the octave mandolin had. And then uh, I'll bring my old uh, camera gear and uh, we'll film something for this mandolin cello. The next question has to do with the intonation video. Uh, G G Blues is asking uh, if I use this trick or the what I'm doing to find the intonation for a conventional mandolin built. Um, I use this trick only when uh, there's uh, no drawings provided. So in the case of mandolins, there is many many established intonation patterns. Uh, I haven't I haven't really needed to find alternative to that one because when I, I tune the mandolin it's pretty much right where it's supposed to be. Uh, so I did this for the octave mandolin because it was a, a full drawing that I created myself and I needed personally to find where all those intonations were going to be. Uh, in regards to the mandolin cello, it's the exact same thing. I've seen pictures of a uh, bridge and then again with those pictures, I don't really know the scale of the instrument so that could affect it. I don't know the string gauge of the instrument, so that could affect it. But I've seen some that goes from uh, one side all the way to the other. And then I've seen some that they staggered back and forth, pretty much like a mandolin bridge. So I've seen uh, pictures of both types. So in that case, it was a case of me uh, feeling confident that I'm actually creating something that I can put my name behind it. And by finding the intonation of each string one by one, I can now be very confident of my findings and where those intonation need to be. So here's a question from P. Petrusa. He's asking, how do I clean out the sanded carved wood debris uh, in the box after the uh, tuning the F holes? So uh, if you watch the uh, voicing video, you saw a lot of like uh, little wood chips, debris, sanding dust is all going inside. And he's asking, how am I, am I gonna clean that up? So what I usually do for that is that I use compressed air. So I have my air compressor. I make sure I have something that filters the, the moisture that could be in there. Uh, so <clears throat> it's the same uh, attachment that I use when I, I use my spray, spray gun to prevent uh, moisture. And then I'm gonna put the nozzle in one hole and spray there. And then I have my dust extractor in the other aperture uh, that catches all the dust coming out and all the wood chips and stuff. And then obviously I'm going to turn the instrument over and over and over, over a certain amount of uh, steps. This way I'll be able to remove the whole content from the inside. So that part is still not done for this one and I still have more sanding to do. So when I get to that step, I'll make sure I, I keep a clip of that so you guys can see how I do it. But uh, uh, there is a clip uh, in the French polishing video of the uh, octave mandolin where I do it. Now a question from Funky Pat. Uh, he says, uh, if a verse improves the tone, why not have them in all acoustic instruments uh, like bass, guitars, etc. Uh, from what I've seen, and I go back to the fact that Verzi doesn't have a lot of information available, uh, is always used on an arch top. So I, I could see it on maybe a jazz guitar, Although a jazz guitar, you really want to poke through like, like a bluegrass player would like. Like most bluegrass player won't go for an instrument that has a verse. It was more for an orchestra uh, environment that those verse were uh, installed. 
So it improved the sound in the aspect that it creates uh, partials in the air, air chamber. So when you listen to, uh, let's say, there's a YouTube video where there's a fellow that actually compares <clears throat> two mandolin by the same manufacturer. It's basically the same mandolin, although they would maybe have a little bit of sound difference. One has a verse and the other one doesn't. And I, I sat there and, and I listened to it on many, like my phone and, and my computer and inside with uh, the TV where like it's got better speakers. And um, what I found is that personally, I prefer the more rich sound of the Verzi. And then my wife is a talented musician and she plays piano, she plays tenor sax, she plays a lot of instruments, guitar and, and the such. And I asked her which mandolin she preferred uh, without, without her knowing which one had the Verzi and not the Verzi. And her answer was like, right on the one with the Verzi as well, because yeah, the sound is more complex. Now, as for a bluegrass player, what you want to do is like cut through. So, so you really want something that projects, uh, that's clear, and that's basically like the the one aspect that the player is going to. So he wants an instrument that's very explosive. When we're thinking of the Verzi, it's a dead weight under the soundboard, and I by dead weight like mine is very very light, but it's still something that like that's your soundboard, and it's still hanging under. So if you see the sound plate when it's plugged moving up and down, now it has to carry that at the same time and make that vibrate. So a lot of energy from the bridge is transferred uh, to the Verzi plate and I guess it in some ways get lost in the mix. It does get lost in an energy point of view. Uh, so the sustain won't be as long, the, the projection won't be as loud. So it, it's not gonna be an instrument as loud as an instrument without the Verzi. But where you lose that, I feel you gain, uh, you make a next change for a sound that is uh, that has more depth to it. Now, that being said, your question refers to bass and guitars. Uh, I've never seen Verzi or any literatures that uh, hints at Verzi being attached to a flat top instrument. Let's say you take any kind of guitars uh, they already have less projection than an art shop. And that's one of the main reasons why jazz guitars are so popular and have the art shop because they have so much more projection. An interesting article that was sent by, uh, uh, by uh, Bo Blob 2003, he sent me an article called Why Violins Have F-Holes. And it's from the science and history of remarkable uh, Renaissance design. And I read the article and it's really interesting to see how this shape uh, affects the sound. And like the, you see like in the early days, like the violins had the C shape and, and then it kind of evolved and stretched into this shape. It was a very interesting read and I really uh, appreciate uh, this person to send me this article. But to go back to the guitar, I don't think the guitar has enough energy in it to have a Verzi attached to the bottom. And that's just a personal opinion. I've never made any test on it. I've seen the very renowned Luthiers that says you don't put a dead weight under uh, a soundboard uh, ever. And uh, uh, I wanted to make my own findings. I find that this instrument, the way it is right now, sounds great. I do have good sustain with the instrument, good projection. So I, I at this point, I would be curious to see the same instrument, and I might do that in the future, uh, this instrument without the Verzi, and then I can make a, a, ver, a, like a better judgment call as to, oh yeah, that one sounds very, that much louder, and this one has a more depth in the sound, and then the two instruments could be kind of uh, their own thing, and then uh, one could be used more into a bluegrass setting, and the other one more into an orchestra, like this one would be more into an orchestra setting. Another question by Jipes Blues. Uh, he asked me if I ever uh, thought about a lateral sound hole uh, that uh, some luthier do on more modern builds. Uh, it is not something that ever really crossed my mind. 
uh, I find them kind of funny looking. And after reading the article that I just mentioned uh, from uh, Blue Blob 2003, uh, just reading about how the apertures amplifies the sound and that it was developed over like hundreds of years, uh, I think I'm gonna stick with this design and maybe even try to stretch it more instead of opening laterally. So once again, a very good article. You guys should really read that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I've never really thought about putting a hole on the side here. Uh, Jason is asking me uh, what is the tuner program that I'm using on my computer. Uh, I'm using the Peterson Strobosoft Strobe Tuner. Uh, there's many uh, different level. Uh, there's the entry level and then the suite and then there's the deluxe. Uh, to do the tap tuning, you need the 2.0 deluxe version. Otherwise, it will show there, but you won't be able to enable it. So it is a bit on the pricey side. Uh, it's super useful in the shop when you're building instruments like that. And the last question for today is from Tony Rizzo. Uh, how does the Verzi that I installed in this instrument affects the sound relative to voicing? Have you come to any conclusion on its value? Did it affect the voicing at all? Uh, the voicing uh, is basically the step you take to uh, tune all the components of the all the tune components you already put together. So, like through the, through the videos, you you've seen that I've tuned the front. You've seen that I've tuned the back. Once we add the strings on it, we add tension. Uh, once we glue the backboard on, the tuning we just did is restricted by the, the glue up all around and therefore is uh, really not the note anymore that you put it on. Uh, the fact that we voice every part is to uh, first have a, a reference to when I build another one. Now I know this one sounds great, so most likely we'll put my back plate to the same uh, the same note that I use for this one and I can go from there as well if I feel like that I don't have enough response from the back I can go thinner if I feel that it's too thin I can go thicker so it's a reference point uh, for building instruments now his question is that uh, does it affect the sound relative to the voicing uh, the voicing part is an airflow going in and out of the instrument so that's why we're trying uh, that's what we're trying to calibrate uh, a, a good balance of uh, airflow in, airflow out. Uh, the Virzi itself produce a sound inside of the instrument. So does that create more airflow? Uh, I think the airflow is already in that box itself. So I don't think it would uh, affect the voicing, but I think it would affect the tone of the instrument or the the sound structure of the instrument itself. I hope it makes sense. Uh, it's it's uh, like I said, like not a lot of information on the Verzi. I, I thought your question was great. Uh, if I came to any conclusion on its value, like I mentioned a bit earlier, I love how it sounds. Uh, I would have to make another one to see the difference or hear the difference in between the two. Obviously the other one would be clearer and most likely have more projection. Do I, do I want that? Like, I mean, like right now, that thing is really loud the way it is. Uh, I don't think I would need more or a player would need more than that. So as what conclusions do I get from it? I'm really happy I tried it. I've never ha I've actually tried a Verzi in an instrument. And I feel from my findings that if it's thin enough or light enough, I should say, if it's light enough, it won't impact uh, much on the overall response of the instrument uh, and by that I don't mean uh, loudness and uh, projection wise because it does affect that but I'm, I'm thinking more in the realm of like when you play an instrument and losing all the momentum or all that energy right away like if you plug a string and then your sound dies right away I mean like I can just do this one and it rings forever. It's gonna ring probably like close to 20, 
20 seconds sometimes when I, I plug the one string like it's still going right now and uh, so I'm really happy uh, does it affect the sound yes in a good way in my book uh, and I'm really happy with uh, with uh, this build right now so uh, I hope that doesn't turn out to be too long of a video I uh, really appreciate your time for stopping by and watching this video um, that's something that was on the back burner for a while. But don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Uh, a lot of build videos. Uh, I'm going to keep going with the Q&A's. Uh, like I mentioned early on, be, keep, keep an eye for the blueprints coming up for uh, the ukulele on my uh, website. Uh, the other prints are now available as well. And until next time, I wish you well.